Today on the Bible Reading Challenge podcast, we are going to give an overview of the book of Amos. My name is Aaron Ventura, and I'm joined today by campus preacher Keith Darrell. Keith, welcome back to the show. Glad to be back. Thanks for having me. So we are in the book of Amos, another uh, pretty unfamiliar book for a lot of people. So let's talk about who this guy is. And we actually, unlike some of the other prophets, we actually know a tiny little bit about him. So what do we know about Amos? uh, Well, we get a little glimpse and we actually get some autobiographical information in the text. So in chapter seven, uh, he's kind of being called out for being a false prophet and they want to send him away. And he's basically verifying his call. He says, in verse 14, I was no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore figs. Uh, but the Lord took me from following the flock and the Lord's, uh, and the Lord said to me, go prophesy. And so uh, he was some sort of shepherd um, working with beasts of the field. We don't know exactly what his vocation was, even what it may- means to work the sycamore fi- figs. Like we're not 100% sure what that is. But that's kind of his occupation. We're not really sure how the vision happened to him or the call happened to him, but then he gets called from this vocation yeah. to go prophesy to Israel. Yeah, as I was reflecting on this, because like Amos is, seems like a guy you would like, right? He's he's a man of the people. He's a shepherd. He's he's he seems to be like a working man. Some would say maybe he's a little more of like a, a businessman making transactions or or a merchant, but he seems to be kind of a humble shepherd and a tender of fig trees and. Those are two really rich metaphors that God uses over and over again for his people. So Israel, we've seen elsewhere, is likened to a a fig tree. Jesus is going to actually curse a fig tree in the Gospels. And then they're also like sheep without a shepherd. And so it's interesting in his vocation, I I think part of why we are maybe given this information, he is uh, being called from that kind of physical vocation to the spiritual vocation, um, and and there's a symbolic connection there. Yeah, and I think there there's actually tons of symbolism. What we're going to see throughout is even when they're told uh, the prophet to go away, there's uh, richness in their land, but then there's going to be a famine in the land. And I think also his ability, you know, he's working with the, from the trees are providing food, the animals are providing food, and there's also going to be a famine in the land. So, so much of that richness to famine, and so as you in general, as you read through the Bible, there's always this lex talionis or eye for an eye sort of uh, thing. So when you have richness and it leads to rebellion to God, you can expect famine and things like that. So you just kind of see that throughout the book of Amos as well. Yeah. And this is true both in scripture and in history. Just God's justice is lex talionis. It is eye for eye. And so uh, you're going to see, you're going to note some of that and how um, these judgments are laid out. And it's also instructive in how we're trying to read our own time. So we're we're also trying to identify what are the places that God, uh, who are the idols that God is knocking over? Uh, what have we been worshiping? And you can kind of do that, the inverse, yeah, right? Kinda, if, yeah, you kind of start to do the math and you can begin to see the connections. And one of the things I always say uh, is, is just kind of give the news cycle two weeks. It, it seems to be like whatever is, everybody's up in arms over, two weeks later will get flopped and then they're not necessarily up in arms over. But so like, I, I do believe ultimately that God's laughing, kind of mocking us with, with what we exalt. And even just the idea that eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, just again, to reiterate that it's, it's not this, we often have a tendency to think that it's this extreme punishment on thing, but the basic concept of it is that the punishment fits the crime. And and so, yeah, if you pluck out an eye, you lose an eye. It's not like you pluck out an eye, therefore death. You know what I mean? It's So, so it's actually one of those things in our culture, it's often seen as like this bad, abusive thing. Uh, but biblically, it's actually the punishment fits the crime. Justice is equal to the crime that's being committed. Yeah, and you need that to have a proper understanding of the gospel because it hell makes no sense. The atonement makes no sense. The cross makes no sense if uh, there isn't perfect justice. But if, ju- if God is a just God, it sets up the question of how he could save anybody, period, or let anyone even take another breath. There needs to be some kind of standard a way of meeting that perfect justice and then some other way of also showing mercy. Yeah, and, w- and the importance of that is oftentimes when hell's being denied, I was in a Bible study even last night where they're kind of like, seems like an extreme punishment by God. Um, 
kind of the R.C. Sproul, what's wrong with you people? Uh, we have to make much of our rebellion against God. Uh, we can often downplay it. Um, and I think the reality of it is, and we see this in the prophets, so that's why oftentimes they shake us, is like, this seems so extreme that these things are going to happen to these people. Um, but we take sin so lightly. And we are all humanists at this point, essentially, as uh, Western, America, uh, Western Christians. And so what we need to grasp, though, is the reality that rebellion against God is worthy of death and judgment. So. Yeah. So let's talk briefly about the historical context of this book. So it, it does begin by, by telling us this happened uh, during the reign of King Uzziah. So this is the, one of the kings in Judah. And then Jeroboam II over in the, in the north in Israel. And this is uh, important in just understanding uh, some of the worship centers that are discussed here. So Samaria is the northern capital. And if you remember when the kingdom split after uh, uh, after Solomon's reign between Jeroboam and Rehoboam, uh, the first thing that Jeroboam did, the first Jeroboam, was set up a rival worship center in Bethel. Now, Bethel is uh, has a significant place if you read Genesis, and it kind of makes sense why they would try to uh, turn that into a rival worship site. So when God is uh, going to talk about uh, chastise them for offering sacrifices in Bethel, that's because that was the rival idolatrous high place uh, over against Jerusalem, Mount Zion, the true uh, place of proper worship and sacrifice. So you already have uh, mixed in here this d- this divided kingdom. Uh, Israel is still going. They have not fallen yet. Um, and then there's also this marking of time by the earthquake. Uh, d- have you, Did you look into the earthquake at all? Uh, I, I did not really look in the earthquake. There, you have a reference to it. Most likely, I think it's Zechariah 14. Yep. There's also a reference. And you have several references to the earth shaking here in Amos. So I don't. I did not see like the specific historical date of when uh, this earthquake was alleged to have happened. But it was obviously, you know, um, when I was growing up, we had this San Francisco earthquake that stopped the World Series. So there's, it was a clear demarcation in their culture yeah. that kind of set things apart. Yeah, and I, I looked this up. There's, there is no real exact time stamp where we know, okay, this is uh, when that earthquake happened or what, what year it did. Uh, but we do know that this is some kind of warning shot. So we tend to deny quote unquote, natural disasters. Although I think insurance companies still call them acts (laughs) Acts of of God. God, Uh, We tend to deny that those have any spiritual relevance to our nation or to the spiritual health of uh, a country. So if there's a a famine in the land, we don't immediately think, oh, we better repent. We tend to think uh, climate change. Uh, And that's that's exactly the point where we, the last thing we think that there would be a God who would judge us. So, you know, Whatever somebody thinks of the Haiti earthquake like a decade ago or maybe like 13 years ago, it was a giant earthquake in Haiti. And, you know, it's Pat Robertson. So everyone's like, oh, whatever, Pat Robertson. But he makes a comment about God's judgment. And everybody loses their minds, even Christians. And so even as Christians, we're terrified to speak of God's judgment. But historically, like I can think of Wesley's, they'd have an earthquake and they'd often preach this is God's judgment upon this culture and upon this people. And so we're often terrified of those things. And we do need wisdom. And we'll talk about this a little bit more later. Uh, but we, we do need wisdom in doing those things rather than just, you know, shouting out people that God's judgment, but uh, the reality of it is, you know, is he not the Lord of all the earth? Uh, does the earth not shake uh, without him doing it? So the reality of it is that the they were understanding these things as God, yeah, kind of like a warning shot. Whereas I, even in our own culture, I think we should have taken 9-11 as a pretty major warning shot across yeah. the bow. You know what I mean? It seems <laughs> like God has been giving us plenty of warning. And if you think about, he, he gave Egypt 10 plagues, like those 10 <laughs> Pretty significant warning shots that you think, man, would they really get the picture? And then they just get worse and worse and worse. And you think about something like 9-11, and then you think about uh, what just has recently happened with the COVID moment and some of the other turmoil in our country, the rioting in the streets. It's like, clearly something is, something's amiss, (laughs) something's up. And, And I think being a dutiful reader of scripture will make you a better reader of what's happening in the world to, to discern the signs of, of the times. Okay, so let's uh, kind of break out 
this book, there's a kind of a simple outline to it. The, the first six chapters are oracles of judgment because we're in the prophets. This is basically what's happening in all the prophets. And then uh, the last three, uh, seven, eight, nine, last three chapters are visions that Amos sees. And there is this pattern in the, the first two chapters of this kind of three, um, how does it go? For three transgressions of fill in the blank and a four, God said, I'm not going to turn away my punishment. So let's just talk about this section of, of judgment on on the nations. What What is going on here? Yeah, well, for, for starters, in verse two, it says, uh, and he said, the Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds mourn and the top of Carmel withers. And so this is the Lord basically coming from his holy place and he is a roaring lion and which is, you know, uh, He's coming in judgment, and when a lion roars, people people tremble. And so it, it starts off with his judgment. And what you what, what's kind of interesting what you first have is uh, him prophesying to the nations that all these nations around Israel are going to be judged. And I think part of the rhetoric that's going on there, yes, God is judging these nations, but it's almost like I think the Israelites could sit there and be like, "Yep, go get Damascus. Yep, go get the Edomites. Yep, go get them." And then he turns it on to Israel and just says, "Oh, and not only the, these nations, but it's coming upon you as well." And then he really lays into uh, Israel starting in uh, chapter t- uh, midway through chapter two. And so um, I think what's basically going on there is he's setting the stage, the prophetic element, kind of like when Nathan goes to uh, David and was like, oh, this guy does this, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, oh, that man should be put to death. Oh, and you're the man. And so Israel is the man. Uh, so, so yes, there's judgment coming upon the nations who are doing these wicked things. But I think what he's basically doing is, is bringing them to a place where they're like, yes, yes, yes. And then wham, it's falling on Israel. Yeah. If you are Israel and you're extolling that your God is the God of gods and he is the God of universal justice, you tend to just automatically apply that to those guys out there, to those nations who are our enemies, to those who have, who, who clearly are idolatrous and don't worship Yahweh. And yet I think you are totally right in that the prophet is gathering momentum. He's gathering the crowd and, and you're someone who, that this is part of your job, right? <laughs> to figure out how can you gather a cr- crowd so that you can preach to them. And I think that's kind of what he's doing here and saying, yep, Damascus, Gaza, Tyre, Edom, Ammon, Moab. And you're just kind of like, yeah, this is WW, like put, <laughs> like put the smack on all these nations. And he's like gathered them to the point where now he can go, oh, and Judah, yeah. oh, and Israel. And so you have these seven nations. And there's all sorts of s- patterns of seven in this book. Um, if you read uh, David Danielle has a book analyzing the literary structure of uh, all the books in the Old Testament. And there are just – this book is littered with sevens, but I won't uh, tire you with uh, trying to lay lay all those out. But there's clearly a, a pattern here that he is building to that climaxes with, and yet judgment is also going to fall uh, in far worse on them because they have more light. They have more knowledge. Yeah, and even w- one of the things that's kind of interesting is uh, Amos 3 verse 2. He says, you only – I have known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. And so Israel's judgment is greater because who they are. And so similarly, Christian, if you've been baptized, if you're in the church, you're reading the word, you're listening to the Bible reading challenge, and you go after iniquity, your judgment will be worse than the Chinese who have never heard or whatever it may be. And so, uh, yeah, the nature of this covenantal uh, aspect that's going on that, you know, if, if a woman, you know, there's, there's a, there is a difference between a woman who's fornicating and then the adulterous woman. And so Israel is being adulterous. Uh, the other nations are, you know, they're just that their natural promiscuity. And so there's a judgment there, but it's a different capacity with the adulterous woman. Yeah. So if, if we were to kind of apply this to us, if we're supposed to, as preachers, imitate this kind of prophetic, uh, denunciation when, when we're preaching God's word. I think one of the applications that I take from it is that the preacher must be an equal opportunity offender. And we've, uh, you see some in what you might call like a big Eva, you know, in uh, some of these very popular churches or crossway authors who are known for uh, punching right and leaning left. Uh, so Keith, what do you think about that? And how would a book like Amos inform how preachers are to approach who we punch and where we lean. Yeah, and if kind of get the language of a plumb line, uh, later the prophet picks up this language of plumb line that the wall is supposed to be straight, but Israel's crooked. Um, we need a plumb line, and our plumb line is the word of God. And even as preachers and as teachers, as Christians, 
the Bible has to be our ultimate authority. Uh, we know that intellectually, um, but are we doing that practically in our culture? Or do we look at certain groups that say, oh, well, they kind of have an affinity towards us, so we're not going to be as offensive towards them. So Trump's maybe throwing us a bone, so let's not be totally offensive towards his immorality or whatever it may be. So I do think there's wisdom to that. And even Paul in Acts chapter 17 it says some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers will listen to him. If you listen to that sermon there, there are certain things that the Epicureans would be like, boo, and the Stoics would be like, boo, then other things are like, okay, we can listen to that. And so what we're looking to do as Christians is not be right wing, left wing, but be absolutely faithful to the word of God. Like, yeah, we go and preach the word of God. And Amos here, he he kind of lays waste to false worship. And you know, in the evangelical church, in the American Reformed Church, where is there f- false worship? We should have no qualms rebuking those things. And I kind of hate the word social justice. There's just justice. But Amos is one of the classic books that people appeal to for social justice. And, and there are things because, yeah, are we oppressing the poor? Do we go about our business? We go to church Sunday. But what we're really looking forward to is can't wait till tomorrow morning to sell. Like, are our religious activities these dead festivals that Yahweh hates? Um, and so going to and – and it's one of the things in our reform circles. I was living in New York and uh, it, would, it would often – we'd go with this objectivity of the covenant, which I wouldn't totally disagree with. But it, ena- it enabled us to just say, oh, well, you know, they're a member of good standing. You know what I mean? And, and it was kind of like this loose – like they're not doing anything too blatantly rebellious and wicked. But is anybody's heart really there? And, that, and you know, without falling into a total pietism – where none of the physical things matter because they clearly matter, um, we, we have to find that balance as we correct, repro- reprove, rebuke, and train in righteousness. And so I, I think it's a difficult thing to do and always goes back to do we fear God where we have wisdom? And if we fear God, that's the beginning of wisdom, we'll have wisdom to address those issues. Yeah, I think knowing our own natural inclination, what what is the temptation that the preacher typically has? And it's to flatter those who are closest to him, those who... Uh, pay their tithes and, you know, it's, it's your livelihood. So there's some kind of like conflict of interest. You don't, you don't want to rock the boat. Or if you're someone who uh, is being welcomed into places of power. So you see uh, Azariah is going to uh, complain against him in chapter seven and say, man, stop speaking bad about our president. Like stop, stop criticizing him. You go do, go do that somewhere else. And Amos is like, your wife's going to be a widow. You're kissing. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Amos clearly has that kind of courage, the bravery, uh, that kind of masculine voice to um, go against this evil authority in the name of the higher, truer authority. And I think we tend to, uh, and you have examples of this also in Daniel in the time of the exile, where you have people in positions of power that have to walk in wisdom. They're maybe they're counseling the king, but you also, as a as a pastor, as a preacher, you reserve the right because you don't speak for yourself. You speak for God. You have to tell the truth. And I think we have to tell the truth, not just about the sins that the left is doing, but the sins on the right. And, and we have to have equal weights and measures. And so you see this in like little Twitter fights, whether people are apologizing or whether we're confessing, you know, racism in this denomination or uh, being too fundamentalist over here. Yeah, there's going to be sins wherever you go, but we can't, well, we want to just be aware of where are we tempted to lean and where are we tempted to punch? And, and let scripture continue to reshape that. Cause I'm sure you and I could point to times where we have probably gone too easy on our own because we don't want to make them look bad. And we've gone maybe too hard and given or, or given some people a pass that we shouldn't have. And so we all fail in sin in some way in this area. And so we want to, we want scripture to inform us how we do that. Yeah. And I think one of the ways to try to keep that front and center when Jesus tells us to take up our cross and follow him. I, I do think the application, when you're looking at the cross of Christ, you see where God is unflinchingly holy and hates sin, and yet he loves the world. And if you're taking that to your context where you're going to go preach to, say, Trump, or you're going to go preach to Biden, and you're taking that kind of cross, um, you can go there with an unflinching holiness. You can also go there with grace and love because that's where you've seen it for yourself as well. So I, I think that's kind of you know, if we're constantly going back to the cross and meditating upon that of how do I now preach to these people, uh, I think that would be kind of a place where we want to be. Yeah. And a, a prime example of speaking the truth in love is Amos chapter four. So let's go to this this, this great 
text here. Um, so it says this, hear this word, you cows of Bashan, Bashan, who are on the mountains of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, bring wine, let us drink. The Lord God has sworn by his holiness, behold, the days shall come upon you when he will take you away with fish hooks and your posterity with fish hooks. You will go out through broken walls, each one straight ahead of her, and you will be cast into Harmon, says the Lord. Come to Bethel and transgress at Gilgal. Multiply transgressions. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three days. Offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving with leaven. Proclaim and announce the freewill offerings. For this you love, you children of Israel, says the Lord God. God. And if you weren't catching the sarcasm in my voice, uh, God is actually being sarcastic here. And he also is calling someone cows of Bashan. So, uh, Keith, let's talk about prophetic rhetoric and what's happening in this passage here. So, who, who first of all, do you think he's referring to? There, there are kind of two uh, interpretive options here. Yeah, it's either to a collective, including the males and females of kind of the elite class, or it is a specific reference to the women of the elite class and the ruling class. And I think it's probably most likely to the women. I think that's the what, what makes sense of the, of, the, of the flow here, including to say to your husbands, bring uh, bring that we may drink. And so, yeah, I think he's, he's going after them in a very uh, specific word picture sort of way that Anybody who's standing there at the time who knows what these cows are, I think he has an idea. They know what he's referring to. And I do – so – but I also think it's not a mere insult. Like, it's, hey, you're fat. You know what I mean? He's, I don't think it's merely one of those. But I, what I do think is going on here, if you remember with it, Ehud and Eglon, uh, he was identified as a fat man. I don't – so I don't think in of itself being fat in that culture is this horrendous sort of thing. But I, I think it's more of a reference or being fattened up to be slaughtered. And so just as I think Eglon was a fat man that gets slaughtered, I don't think it's just like an insult to say he was fat. I think he's – you bring the fatted calf. We're going to slaughter these things. So I think – the, the the punch isn't just, hey, you're fat. It's you're going to be slaughtered. So I actually think it's more potent and powerful uh, rather than just a, a mere insult. Although I think the imagery is also, you know, I, don't, I don't know if insulting is the right word, but it, it's setting them up for the slaughter, I believe is what's going on. Yeah. And I think the connection <clears throat> is how did they get fat? So the assumption here is they were oppressing the poor, they're crushing the needy, and they're you know, they're laid out on their couch telling their husbands to bring them more wine. And so you don't have this image of like a, a America's top model kind of skinny lady. You have someone who's kind of this wealthy matriarch who's she's she's issuing commands to her Lord, to her to her husband, Br bring wine, let us get drunk. And so I'd say, uh, yeah, this isn't just saying, to a bunch of women in the church, y'all are super fat and, and you know, I have a biblical license to do yeah, that. Uh -huh. But it's saying you have, you have gotten rich, you have fattened yourself by uh, impoverishing the people who are most needy in the community. And so the call later on to uh, hate evil, to love good, to establish justice goes back to what they have been doing here. They've been corrupting justice and getting fat. So uh, I think the, the command here, uh, the, if we were to preach this sermon today, who would we aim this at, do you think? I'll have to think about that. The, um, well, there is, there is an elite ruling class that in a sense does not work. Uh, yeah, even, whatever, whatever you think of the current game stock thing that's all going on, uh, there at is at least in the appearance of a group of people who are getting wealthy by oppressing another group class of yep. people and holding down the little man. This is supposedly uh, the little man fights back and he's losing currently if you're paying attention. But so the, the reality of it is like there there are people and even this laziness that there is like a ruling class that's able to get wealthy. Uh, you think of anybody who goes into a political office and then they come out, then they get these huge sums of money um, to lobby certain causes and stuff like that. And it has to be dressed up as, oh, we're out here to help the little guy. But things like the minimum wage actually hurt the little guy. But here they are out um, lobbying for these things in the appearance of virtue, but it's actually hurting and oppressing uh, the poor. So I, I think there is, you know, millions probably of people in the United States that these sorts of indictments would fit against because they are in positions of power that hurt, oppress, and hold people down. Yeah. So I, I think that's worth thinking about uh, as you're reading the text. You know, is there a modern audience that this would 
apply to. And it is the people who are, I think in our culture right now, we now we have this Biden administration and they're discussing, you know, another stimulus plan. And it's interesting just watching the rhetoric they use and then where that money's going to go. Uh, if you follow the money, you you find where the heart is, where the where the where the treasure is, and you also find out if it's genuinely going to help people who need help, or if in the name of helping the poor, in the name of helping people who need help, they're actually helping themselves. And so I think that's what Amos is targeting: is these people who are using uh, political power, influence to actually take uh, offer bribes. So uh, that, that would be one of the, the main charges against uh, the Israelites is they're corrupting justice. The judges are taking bribes and you have an entire system that God wants to come and, and knock over. Yeah, you look at, you know, in my lifetime, uh, I don't know what Jimmy Carter's worth, but, or Ronald Reagan, but the Bushes were wealthy going in. But if you look at uh, the Clintons and you look at Obama coming out, their, their wealth from going into the presidency to coming out of the presidency, so I, I don't remember the Clintons exactly, say it was a million dollars entering, now they're worth like 45 or maybe even like $100 million, whatever it is. But it's just this exponential because of their positions of power. And to think that that is all because of their benevolence, um, I think is misdirected. And so there are very specific individuals um, that I believe that we can preach these things to. Yeah. Continuing in chapter four, uh, you have a, a great example here of what God's discipline looks like. And I kind of just walk through them. It says, I'll, I'll give you cleanness of teeth. And that's not like I have a good dental plan. <laughs> that means the teeth are set on edge. There's there's no food. So yeah, you're not, yeah, you're, not you're not eating. So that's the, that's the wrong kind. Of, it's, it's funny what things are blessings and curses and you think, oh, that, I want clean teeth. No, you don't. Not, not the biblical kind. So uh, when God disciplines his people, he gives them lack of bread. He withholds rain from certain cities. And you'll notice uh, when people have to travel to get water or travel to other cities, God is, God is saying that was actually a sign from me. When, when the rains didn't come during harvest and you had to go to a place you nor normally don't have to go, you were supposed to think, we're under judgment. We need to repent. Uh, next thing, blight, mildew, locusts, uh, the crops are destroyed, plague and warfare. So these are all the marks. If you are seeing these kinds of things in your country, in your nation, God says, these are, these are actually loving signs. These are the, the stop signs before you go to offer more sacrifices to your false gods. Yeah, and he, start, he starts off with... with a real mockery, uh, verse four through five, where he's like, "Come to Bethel and transgress, and Gilgal, multiply your transgression." So he's mocking their worship. Yeah, and they're highly certain, religious. Yeah, and so they're doing everything they're supposed to be doing, but in complete rebellion. And this fits well with again everything going on with the prophets is covenantal. Leviticus chapter twenty six, starting in verse fourteen, he says, "If you rebel, hear the judgments upon you, and if you don't repent, then I'm going to do this to you." And so you, the the chastisement becomes greater and greater and greater until you almost reach the point where you know full up the uh, measure, the full measure, and you know then the final consummation comes when the, the end comes. And so right now though, it is him being gracious and long suffering. And, and that's even one of the things, you know, they end up wanting the day of the Lord to come. He's like, why do you, like even us as, as Christians, like, yo Lord, bring your judgment. He's like, it's going to be darkness rather than light. Realize what you're asking for. And so the reality of it is we should be as Amos uh, ends up interceding, we should be interceding for our nation, going to the Lord and asking that you would relent of your judgments. Because, I mean, just look at the chaos that we're in. And what we need to do is petition him, intercede for our culture and ask the Lord to grant repentance and that we would heed these signs of, you know, we don't even know what a male and female is anymore. Like how bad have we gotten that something as obvious as that is now up for grabs? And so we are under God's judgment. We can't think clearly. Um, and so, yeah, the, the remedy is calling people back in repentance. Yeah, I think if you you are a, a Jew or an Israelite and you you love God's justice and you're thinking, yes, God, bring the day of the Lord on Damascus and Tyre and Edom and all those nations that have oppressed you. God's saying it's a package deal. I'm if I'm gonna come in judgment, I'm coming in judgment on on the whole earth. And that includes you. So be careful what you ask for. If you are going to pray, pray down the judgment of God, make sure that you aren't gonna be caught up in it like the, like the flood. Uh, moving into uh, chapter five, uh, starting in verse four, we, we then see God lays out, okay, well, what does repentance look like? And he says, uh, do not seek Bethel. 
Okay, so remember that's the that's the kind of rival high place. Nor enter Gilgal, nor go go to, go to these other places. Uh, and then you you see down in verse eleven, uh, one of the things that God that repentance would look like is. Uh, Therefore, because you tread down the poor and take grain taxes from him, though you have built houses of hewn stone, yet you shall, shall not dwell in them. Yet you have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink wine from them. So if you're thinking, what does repentance look like? Look like It would look like stop taxing the poor with these grain taxes uh, later on. Stop afflicting the just and taking bribes. Uh, stop diverting the poor from justice at the gate. And then it it ends with that seek good and not evil. Hate evil and love good. Establish justice in the gate. It may be possible that the Lord will be gracious. So uh, this is your kind of repentance strategy. If you're a nation looking at, okay, we, we've clearly done all these things. Well, where do we start? Um, God lays out that program. Any other comments on this yeah, section? I, I think even as we do evangelism and people are coming into the church, um, we ought to be encouraging new converts to go back and right their wrongs. And so even when uh, John the Baptist is preaching in Luke chapter 3 and the tax collectors come to him, uh, teacher, what shall we do? He says, collect no more than you were authorized to do. And so anywhere you've been involved in, say, shady business dealings and you've been robbing from people or stealing from people, go back and make it right. And so part of what it looks like to, you know, it, it's not just returning to worship. And so what, what God, Yahweh wants is not just merely go to church, um, but go to church, but to begin to seek him live. And as you live, make restitution to those whom you have wronged. And I think as a church, we would do well. And you'd be surprised at how many people you're able to share the gospel with by going back to them and like, hey, I was not a Christian. I'm now a Christian. I've wronged you in this way. And if there's a literal restoration that needs to take place where if you stole from them $100 and you go back with $400, I think we'd be wise and in, even in our individual evangelism uh, to, to begin to carry those things out on individuals and, and call them to repentance in that way. Yeah. Uh, jumping to the very end of the book, and I wanted to uh, close by discussing the way this is used in the New Testament. So, uh, you have uh, Amos 9, 11 to 15. After all of these judgments, uh, God makes this promise of restoration. It says, on that day, I will raise up the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down and repair its damages. I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does this thing. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper. And then it goes on to kind of describe this era of fruitfulness. Uh, so this is quoted um, in Acts 15. Uh, tell us how the way the New Testament uses this verse helps us understand what, what Amos is doing here. Yeah, I think going into Acts chapter 15, if you're not familiar with that, basically you have Gentiles who are coming in and then you have the Judaizing element. You have these people who are Jews saying, oh, well, if the Gentiles want full status as God's people, they need to be circumcised and keep Torah and all of its parts. And so there's a debate in the early church and it's a very reasonable debate. If you're a bunch of Jews and your identity is the law of God and everything else, then you have all these unclean Gentiles starting to come in and believe that Jesus is the Messiah. How do you integrate them into your community? And to integrate them, do they need to be circumcised? Do they need to, you know, keep kosher and that sort of stuff, or do they not? And you have a group of people saying they have to be circumcised, they have to keep kosher and all these other things. And so you have this council in Jerusalem uh, and the apostles meet and they basically come to the conclusion, no, the Gentiles don't have to do these things. And they end up quoting in Acts chapter 15, verse 16, this uh, Amos chapter nine, verse 11. And the basic idea, and I think it's even part of Paul's argument in Romans, I believe it's four, is from the very beginning, Gentiles, Abraham was a Gentile that was brought in. And so God's promise and the place of Israel as a holy nation and a royal priesthood and all that stuff was always kind of a temporary structure building up towards the coming of the Messiah. And so the the proof that they have here, and what's fascinating is you, the, the nations, you, you start off Amos with the beginning of judgment upon the nations, then the nations who are called by his name come in. And so the point with the apostles in the early church, and it ties into Leviticus as well, is what you what you have is from the beginning, God has always desired to engraft the Gentile nations. Even when the Israelites came up out of Egypt, they were a mixed multitude. So God's desire was always there. And the prophets spoke of a day when Gentiles as Gentiles 
would actually come to the kingdom. And so they get to keep their Gentileness. They don't be, ha, need to become Jewish in order to be the people of God. And it's always been by faith in God's promises. Yeah, I love this verse. Uh, so right after James, he, he stands up after they're arguing about this uh, at the council. James stands up, quotes Amos, and then it says in verse 18, Acts 15, 18, known to God from eternity are all his works. And then they say, they say, therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled and from blood. And then it goes on. But that idea of known to God from eternity are all his works. Uh, clearly, God had a plan from, from the beginning when he chose Israel, he chose them to be a light to the Gentiles. They clearly were not. Right? They went into to darkness. Uh, they became dark like the Gentiles. And now uh, Paul is actually identified as one of these lights of the Gentiles. And we would say also the church, Jesus calls her uh, a city set on a hill. He calls individual Christians, you um, are the light of the world. And so uh, we, are, we are now the fulfillment. Uh, we're supposed to do what Israel uh, had originally was intended to do, but did not in bringing that light uh, to the world. Yeah, and, and ever so briefly, and if you go back to Leviticus 17, 18, it refers to the foreigner and sojourner living amongst you. Those are the things that the foreigner and sojourner had to keep if they're going to live in Israel. And those, I believe, are the things that are reiterated in Acts chapter 15. And so, so it's actually from the Torah as well. And it's not just the prophets, but from the Torah itself. Here's how you Jews and Gentiles get to live amongst each other. And, and so – and then when people bring up, what about homosexuality? Well, those things the foreigner and the sojourner were not allowed to engage in when they were in Israel. So, so it's so we're not cherry picking. The point is we're not cherry picking. Uh, there's prophetic reason for why Gentiles are not being circumcised and why we still maintain sexual norms and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, that's the book of Amos. Up next, we have the book of Zephaniah and then the story of Esther. If you've made it this far, well done. Until next time, keep on reading. 